on his Blue Ridge Mountain homestead. I'm glad we can turn our scrap into something good here. Yeah, me too. Eustace Conway is fighting to protect his wilderness sanctuary from an encroachment of real estate developers. I don't want development here. It's just gonna ruin my water supply, ruin my life, ruin my world. He spent all winter working to pay off a loan on a key plot of land that buffers him from the outside world. But now with the final payment deadline fast approaching, he's falling short. Well, we just need to keep working piece by piece, minute by minute, making money. Yeah. That's all we can do. So far, he's liquidated much of his estate and is now relying on his blacksmithing skills to churn out hand-forged items for sale. We've been building all kinds of little hooks and wall hangers, mementos, curiosities. But with the small ticket items failing to bring in the cash they need, budding bladesmith Raleigh's proposed an idea to boost their bottom line. Raleigh's dabbling in this knife making. It's a more challenging product, but if we can make enough of them and get in production, we can actually make this land payment. Oh, yeah. This is going to be the quintessential production style knife. You've already got a handle there. Oh, yeah. So you've got a handle. All you have to do is forge out the blade. To make the work pay off, the knives have to be cheap to produce. And a collection of old railroad spikes are a free resource if the steel is top quality. I well, wonder how good the carbon content is on these. We need to test these out. We need to see how well these will work. Well, the best metal for knives is something that's just a high carbon steel. It's going to be tough and hard and hold an edge for a long time. Let's try this one, Riley. Just like striking flint and steel to start a fire, a grinder shaves off small bits of the metal, exposing its iron atoms to oxygen and resulting in a spark. That's not looking too good. If we grind it and it's just a few soft sparks, it just kind of piddly fall off of there, then you're probably looking at a soft metal. Uh, do we have a file? Yeah. We know this is good metal. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. You see all those fingers? Yeah, fingers. Looks like Fourth of July fireworks. That's what we That's need. good stuff, yeah. The length, size, color, and quality of the sparks reveal what types of metal are mixed in with the alloy and how much. If we grind it and you see just sort of a big old sparkly array, that's a high carbon steel. Let's test this one, Riley. Blades require the steel to be hammered thin. Without enough carbon in the metal, they won't be strong enough to hold up to heavy duty tasks like chopping and cutting. Man, Riley, it looks like this whole pile of spikes is just that low carbon content. Yeah. Well, one idea I'm having, I'm thinking of old time tools like axes. You can weld in a high carbon piece so you've got high carbon steel inserted into a low carbon body. The low carbon railroad spikes can be upgraded by splitting and fusing into their core pieces of higher quality metal. The process is time consuming, but cost effective if it works. Yeah, I've got enough files that we could uh, cut some pieces of files and put them in there. Yeah, my payment deadline's coming up real soon. I'm hoping in the next few days we can make 15 of these knives. The plan is to turn recycled old railroad spikes into big ticket knives for sale and to use the money to help pay off Eustace's land loan. But before they can forge the blades, they need to upgrade the scrap metal by grafting it together with steel that's strong enough to hold an edge. If we can get a good piece of high carbon steel inserted in between the pieces we're splitting, we're gonna have a quality knife. The railroad spike will form the handle and body of the knife. A high quality bit will form the blade. But first, the steel must be split so it can nest inside. We want to split this thing right down the middle so we can have an equal amount of steel encapsulating it. Uh, hold up. Probably a good time to stop it right there. I think there. so. For their high carbon steel, they're harvesting some old files from Eustace's tool shed. You want to hot cut it? Yeah. The one thing I've learned about that high carbon steel like that, if you get it too hot, it'll just crumble. Yeah. With both pieces prepped, the bit is carefully hammered into place inside the spike. Next, they will be fused together using a technique called forge welding, where high heat combined with pressure creates a permanent bond. You get it sort of hot so it'll melt that borax on there. 
Borax is a mineral that acts like a flux, an agent that runs off impurities like rust by making them quicker to melt. Well, you have to coat everything with the flux. Flux helps keep it clean. It sort of like it keeps trash out of it. Forge welding is tricky when working with two qualities of steel, each with a different melting point. Be cautious with it. And just realize it's so easy to burn it up. We got to be right on the edge of burning it up. They have to hold the heat steady between 1,500 and 2,000 degrees. All right, ready? Yep. Hey, you're better at shaping a knife. You take it. It's just, I mean, it's ruined on the tip. At Eustace Conway's Blue Ridge Mountain Forge. Oh, man, we got that too hot. Dead gun. His plans to make some quick cash are crumbling. They've overheated the high carbon steel bit that is supposed to form the knife blade. And unless they can master the correct formula, their plan for mass production will have to be scrapped. If this doesn't work out, then we just have to start all over again. Where all that's crumbling and cracking away, yep. we can draw what we do have out and still salvage a blade out of it. They can cut off the damaged tip and try reforging it, but the more they work the metal, the thinner it gets. Well, let's see what we can do with it. In a situation like this, all you can do is draw it out and hope that you still got enough left to finish what you need. Here you go. You're drawing it out good. Oh, yeah. That's shaping up nicely, isn't it? Yeah, I'm really liking it. Yeah. Hey, everything's sticking together, and it looks good. Yeah, you're doing I feel doing great, a great about job. it. job. It's at a place now where we can finish a blade. We're going to continue drawing it out and refining the shape of this knife. Just the same old, same old heat, beat, repeat. One thing I like to do when I make a spike knife is twist the handle. It gives it a little flair, and it also makes it more comfortable in the hand. That looks awesome. We've still got one big test, though. We need to quench this thing and make sure it holds an edge. Let's quench it. Yeah, the final test of all is to quench this blade. We've got to make sure that it'll harden and will hold an edge, or else it's a useless knife. OK, here we go. Yeah, there we go. It worked. It didn't warp. It didn't break. The metal didn't separate. We did it. <laughs> Nothing left to do but uh, polishing this thing up, seeing how it looks. I'm pumped about this knife. Boy, it's throwing some sparks now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Is that your acid edge there? Yeah, I'm just using some vinegar. I want to make sure that people can see that we've got different layers of metal in here. The acid in the vinegar bites into the grooves and textures of the metal, highlighting the contrast between the high and low carbon steel in the blade. Oh, yeah, I can see the difference. Wow, check that out. Yeah. I can easily see us getting a couple hundred dollars or more out of each one of these. With that much workmanship in it, yeah. And think about how many spikes we have. If we keep popping these things out like we did this one, we're not going to be too far from you having that land paid off. That's what I'm talking about. Now that we have the first one made, we need to make a whole pile of these knives. This developer, I'm sure he's hoping I won't make this final payment, and he knows probably this is gonna be a tough one, but I've got to prove him wrong. I've got to get this land. Man, we need to oh, get yeah. a few irons in the fire here. We can be making a couple of pieces at a time. Yeah. In North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountains, I hung this thing up here about 14 years ago. <laughs> Eustace Conway is having a fire sale. That's a problem right there, Riley. I'm trying to sell as much as I can to make this final land payment. Two years ago, he purchased an additional 90 acres of land to prevent it from falling into the hands of developers. As a mountain man living free out here, the land is everything. It's like my life. It's like my body. It's my heart, my lungs, my liver, my kidneys. But now I've got one big balloon payment. Got to come up with this $50,000 and not let it fall in the developer's hands. So far, he's raised $20,000 by selling off vintage farm equipment from his vast collection. All right, that is great. And today, 
He's got a buyer willing to pay 1500 more for a cart and pony combo. All right, lower it on down. All right. To make the sale, Eustace is willing to part with his six-year-old Shetland pony. What is this guy? It's probably a back piece. But first, he has to make the 1920s vehicle roadworthy. It's got a pretty good little spring system on it there. It's dirty, and there's a lot of paint peeling off here, but nothing else is wrong except this one broken shaft. The shaft is a steam-bent piece of wood that connects the cart to the horse's harness and is difficult to replace. Let's just take this yeah. on up to the shop. Luckily, Eustace has a lot of these kind of things hoarded back. You know, he's used a lot of these carts throughout his life, and he's always been a horseman and used vehicles like this. Raleigh wastes no time finding the right size spare from Eustace's collection. I got something we might be able to work with here. But retrofitting the century-old steel brackets is a custom job. Tap it through with a little hammer. All right. So we're three-eighths of an inch off. If we bent both of those bolts this way, right, so that it could slide back. Heating the metal to 1,500 degrees makes it malleable enough to stretch. All right. Now hopefully this will be good. Let's see about getting that other side. You about ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I think that's it. All right, let's sign that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did we do it? I think so. It's, <laughs> Heck yeah. It's close enough it'll reach now, so let's try to line up the whole thing. Oh, buddy, it's about to make it. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Hot dog. <laughs> that's a <our> heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. With the new shaft in place, they reassemble the seat. Sweet. And give the whole thing a fresh coat of paint. Once we get a coat of paint on this thing, it's looking sweet, better than I imagined it could look. So I think we're ready to let this thing dry and hook up little Joe. I've got one animal that matches up real good to this cart, and it's little Joe. He's going to be a good driving horse here. And I feel confident about it. That thing looks sweet. What do you think, Riley? Looks good. By restoring a 1920s pony cart and rigging it to a six-year-old Shetland pony named Little Joe. A pony cart is great because it's easier and less intimidating for smaller people like children. All he has to do now is convince a potential buyer that it's the right setup for his 10-year-old daughter. Good to see you. How you been? Hey, Tosh, how are you? You doing OK? Yeah. And right now, he needs every dollar he can get if he's to pay off his land debt by spring. She is excited to see <laughs> him and that cart. Well, let me show you. Awesome. What air is this from? Gosh, it's probably like 1920. Perfect. Yeah, solid floorboard. And the spring's real nice. You're going to have some fun on this thing, Tasha. You ready? Yeah. Come on, boy. Good boy. See, I have to talk to him, and I watch him. I watch his head, watch his ears, see how his ears turn back a little bit. He's listening. I'm going to ask him to go to the right. So I'll pull on the right just a little bit. I'll just pull on this rein here. Aw, it's important to teach the young people. You know, keeping a lot of these old traditions and helping people celebrate them. Aw, see, I, I still want them to go to the left more, so I tell them again, haw, haw, and then I'll say right there. See, that tells them to straighten out, and that's where I want them to go, right there. Do you like it? <laughs> you do? Good. Seeing my daughter in the cart, it reminded me of being in the cart with my grandfather when I was a child. You having fun? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to try him? I do. For her to have that experience like I had with my grandfather was just amazing. Gee. Remember now, don't run over Eustace. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice to see the two of them having a fun time. And that's really what this is going to do for the family, is just give them a chance to be together and bond with the horse. And Kelly can share his childhood experiences. Hello. You don't like him, do you? 
<laughs> Love him. He did a fine job. Well, I'm really pleased. Makes well, me leave happy. Him here, take him home. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pay the man. We're gonna have to get out of here quick before he changes his mind. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's gonna help me pay for the land. I hate seeing my pony go, but it's just the way it's gonna work out. In the North Carolina wilderness. There we go. Trainee homesteaders Ashley and Harrison are holding up their end of an important bargain, trading their labor in exchange for survival lessons from a mountain master. You guys getting the chickens fed? Yeah, hey, good morning. Up. Good, good. Need to get you guys a wood heater for your building. Yeah. I've got one I found over here. Cool. Let's do it. Without an apprentice this season, Eustace Conway's taken the couple under his wing. Since they left the modern world behind four months ago and moved to the land next door. Let's head on down this way. It's just a really cool trade because they want to learn the old mountain man ways and here at Turtle Island, I need all kind of help. I've got an old stove down here. I think is probably 100, 150 years old. Oh, wow. Is it still it's, working? Oh, I think it'll work. We'll find out. We got to dig it out here. Last week, Eustace helped Harrison and Ashley repair a rundown cabin on their property. And while the new siding makes for a warmer shelter than the tent they used in the summer. How about it? Nice. Wow. You guys are in the dry. The four walls alone aren't enough to fight winter's oncoming freeze. It's been insanely cold. Temperatures have been dropping into the single digits, um, and we need heat immediately. It's heavier than I thought. Yeah. I think all the parts are here. See, and this leg is a little wobbly. But what about the other legs? Are they tight? I think these left, Probably. too. Need a little bit of it. We tighten those legs up, and the stove is almost as good as new. Heat, it sort of expands it and sort of burns the rust out or loosens the rust up, and, and you can uh, break free the nut from the threads. It's better than it was. It's definitely tightened up some already. Uh, it's good. The stove is an easy salvage job, but to get it running, they now need to build a chimney. Eustace's plan is to build it for free using a naturally fireproof building material called cob and remnants of stainless steel stovepipe he's collected over the years. See, we're gonna need the straight section for going up, so we'll probably have <clears throat> so pipe coming up, if we have to, to get height, we'll have a couple of them going up. And then it's just a matter of bridging over to the wall. We're in a hurry to get this thing in tonight, so we're going to try to get every base covered that we can. Now we need to put together some cob. I know it's probably going to take a little bit to get everything working. I'm not exactly sure how it's all going to piece together, but I'm hoping that we can make this work. That looks like some good clay. You feel how it's kind of sticky? It sticks together like that. It's got a kind of a clay base to it. And that's what we need to make a big stove pipe. Grab a couple buckets and a couple shovels. We'll see about digging some of this out. So what else do we need to make this? We need sand and uh, some kind of straw or hay or pear. Cobb is basically a recipe with several ingredients in it, and fortunately, we can get all of the ingredients right here at Turtle Island. I've done some work in construction, kind of basic building, but I've never mixed cob before. That's really new to me and something I didn't realize really even existed. Next, we need to get the sand to mix with this, because we need two-thirds sand, one-third clay, so we just need a bunch more sand. Cob is a mixture that you can get directly from the earth. That's why early people used it so much. Let's call that good. The final ingredient is a strengthener that Eustace happens to have over on the farm. Hey, buddy. So we want to get this hair. We'll just get a collection of it over here. Is that it? Yeah, this is the hog hair. See that? That's stiff, strong hair. Eustace is definitely a pack rat. One of the keys we've learned about homesteading is pretty much hanging on to everything we could possibly need, because you never know when you could use it. 
Better head on up there and get the mix going on. We got sand, we got clay, two thirds of this and one third of that, so start mixing. Oh, it's getting cold. Oh yeah. Uh, Wait till you get to dancing. What do you mean? To get this really mixed up good, we gotta put water in it. Uh -huh. And you gotta take your shoes off and just kinda use your feet and your body weight just to mix it up real good. You're kidding. No, I'm serious. That's the only way to really no. do it. You can use all the weight of your body. That's really the best way to mix cob. I don't know about that. I already can't feel my toes. Yeah, just go ahead and start mixing that in a little bit. Ooh. Uh. Keep turning it. Think of it like you're taking the bottom and taking it to the top. Like really, you almost jump in it and dance in it. There you go. It kind of feels like running around on the beach with a bunch of seashells with bare feet on a really cold day. It's not that easy to mix. Uh, while you're dancing, just get you a cob and start making a cob so you can use your hands and your feet at the same time. At first, the mixture felt really mucky but after adding some water and working with it, and mixing it real good, it starts sticking together really well. And when you get one made, just let me have it. Does that look good? Yes, yeah, perfect. All right, another cob. Just keep them rolling. The faster we get this done, the better. Let's just keep it going. Like adobe bricks, the cob mixture will form a solid wall when it dries and serve as a buffer between the hot stovepipe and the cabin's wood frame. Thank you. Huh. Ah. I think it's about time we can put the pipe in. It's getting close here. A section of PVC pipe equal in diameter to the metal stovepipe serves as a form because it will slide easily out of the cob when it's dry. We have to make sure to put around a foot of cob around the pipe as a whole to keep that heat insulated. All right. See how I'm just making this edge so it just comes right up to the wood but not on it? Create some nice edges that are gonna be long lasting edges. It's kind of round in this sharp corner here. Nature likes the stuff to be well-rounded. We're getting close, so we're just gonna keep working. We need to get this thing done so we can get a fire going by tonight. The right height, the right distance, that's perfect that way. Uh, we need to spin that real good to kind of break the bond and then get it out of there and have another soap pipe ready to go through. If we're really careful, we can thread it through here and use the heat from the fire itself to help sort of bake it and cook it to harden it up and make it so that it won't collapse and fall apart. As soon as we get it out, I'm gonna get this stove pipe and send it back to you. As soon as it's through, see if you can uh, connect that one to it. It's a moment of truth. This way, okay? One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Looking good. All right, hold there. Can you hook it up? Yeah, we got it. Let's, Let's get this get thing started. All right, it's smoking. Yeah, I see it smoking up. up there too. Oh yeah. Oh man, I didn't <laughs> think we'd man. make it. I know. <laughs> I'm sure glad we have you. I know. Glad we could work at it together. This thing has come together really nice. Everybody worked hard. We've got a heater in here for them. They've been freezing for a long time, but now they're feeling good. Maybe we can have a hot meal tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to. I'm so thankful to everything that Eustace has done. I mean, obviously without him, we'd still be in that tent. A few years ago, I never thought I'd be learning about making cob and making a wood stove work. It's a lot of work out here, but every new skill we learn helps us learn to adapt to our environment, and the cob is a new one to add to our arsenal. Well, I see you're good and warm now. 
I think I'm gonna head out. I look forward to having your help again. Absolutely. A lot of stuff that I learned from the elders, and I want to honor them and just honor the whole tradition that's as old as life itself of passing it on to the young people. In the snow-covered Blue Ridge Mountains. One, two, three. Eustace's neighbors are holding up their end of the bargain. They're helping me, I'm helping them. It's a, it's a good relationship which means his sawmill is churning out timber for the first time in months. Nice to have some help. I feel pretty good about this trade I've got going with Harrison and Ashley because they're helping me get stuff I need done. And I'm helping them do stuff that I know how to do, so a win-win is where it's at. <sighs> I love seeing all that lumber stack up. I'm glad we could help teamwork helping team, yeah. you know? But the day's work is just getting started because the young homesteaders have a problem up at their cabin that they'll need Eustace's skills to solve. We have to carry up all of the water that we use, dishes we wash, like all the water we drink. Most folks in the city, they're accustomed to just turning a tap on and water comes out. But this little cabin that Harrison and Asher are living in doesn't have any real plumbing like a modern house would. It's about a quarter mile uphill. We have to boil it, too. Yeah, I've got years of experience figuring out water. I'll do my best at coming up with some kind of solution. Anything is better than what we're doing right now. You know, if you had a spring around there, water coming up from deep, deep in the earth, the earth has purified it already. You don't have to filter, you don't have to boil. If we could find a spring, we would be really in good shape on your place. Natural springs are spots where groundwater bursts through the Earth's surface and they're a reliable source of clean drinking water, but not always easy to locate in the dead of winter. Does that look like it right there? Yeah, that's some kind of stonework. It looks like it's man-made. Yeah, I don't think it looks natural. Well, I believe that's the base of a chimney, like for a log house, you know, and yeah. all the wood is rotted away many years ago. There's a good chance you could find a real water source. So I guess what we need to do is just spread out and, and see if we can find it. All right, let's look for it. I knew there was gonna be hardships coming into this. I mean, getting a, a shelter, fire, hopefully water, getting the basic things of, of life that you don't even really think about. I think I see something over here. Check this out. Oh yeah, it's coming out from under that rock right there. Oh yeah. Oh. You see it just flowing out? Yeah. yeah. That's the source. This is the real deal right here. So I think the biggest question is how are we gonna get it all the way up there? How are we gonna get it up there? So now we found a good spring, but we still have the problem of getting the water up to the cabin. The distance is an issue, but so is the 30 degree incline. It'll take some engineering to create enough pressure to push a steady stream of water up the hill. Luckily, Eustace is full of mountain man ingenuity. I'm pretty sure I put it in this shop somewhere. And he saves just about everything that one day he might be able to repurpose. I'm not sure I know exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, I'm probably actually gonna have to find it myself because I don't know what I even put it in. You got a lot of stuff here. Yeah, a lot of it needs to be put back in the right place. I really have a lot of stuff here. Oh, wait a minute, This I think that might be that might be the right box right there. Oh yeah, it says on it, ram pump. Invented around 200 years ago, the ram pump is a primitive hydraulic device that uses the kinetic energy of flowing water to create enough pressure to push it up a hill. It's called a ram pump because of the ramming effect of the pressure. Yeah, I was expecting something a lot bigger than this. I'm not sure what I was expecting when I saw this ram pump, but this is definitely not it. It's a lot smaller. I really have no idea how it's going to get all this water up to our house. The pressure is going to come from gravity, from water going downhill. The tank will fill up with water and pressure, like more and more and more and more and more. I just want to send the water and the pressure somewhere, so it's going to send it the only way it can, which is that way, sort of like to the path of least resistance. 
and pushing it up to your house. Pump water uphill, but no electricity, that's pretty cool. Next thing we need to do to get this thing all put together and ready to pump the water up to their house is to build a little intake filter, which is simply a thing to keep trash from getting into the line. Basically, this is just where the water will come in. I'm gonna wrap this with a piece of screen. It's pretty secure. Right on. Tie this up here. So this is the last piece of the puzzle here. Yep. See if we can make it up that hill. We'll go put it together and see what happens. Great. All right, let's do it. Yeah. So this is what we have to have submerged. Basically, we want as much water around this as possible. This is our intake filter. That screen will keep leaves and stuff from getting in the holes. We need to put this down in a puddle, and that puddle's not deep enough right now, so we need to dig it out. The key to maintaining enough pressure to push the water up the 30-degree hill is to keep a constant flow through the intake filter. And so now we just need to bury this filter down in the puddle. We could take these rocks to build a bit of a dam right here. You guys got that looking great. And we've got a full flow here. You see how much water's coming out? Oh, yeah. You can't get any better than that. Once we have the intake filter in place, we're just going to lay the pipe all the way down to the correct amount of drop to get down to the pump. The pump uses gravity to build pressure that pushes the water uphill. I'm guessing that the cabin is about 80 feet up, so that means we need about 12 feet of drop. How close are we? Only a couple feet. A couple feet further we need to go? Yeah. Hopefully my calculations will work out, but I'm just kind of looking up and guessing how high a tree is and guessing that the top of the tree is about the elevation of the cabin. A good run of pipe there. I think that's all we need. Try it out and see if it works. The way we're going to install the pump is just hook it to the pipe coming down the hill and have it sitting on the ground, basically, with some rocks to hold it steady. When that pressure tank pumps up, we'll have, like, 30 pounds of pressure pushing it up the hill there. Hopefully, that'll make it up to your house. We'll find out. We just need to get some water to right here, test it out, and see if it works as good as I think it's going to work. Could you go up there and just connect that pipe to put the water down through here? Yeah, sure thing. Just give me a holler right before you connect it. I'll go ahead and open this line here. <sighs> All right, it's connected. All right, let's just see what we got. It's working now. Oh, yeah, that's the click we need right there. Awesome. That's <laughs> pumping. What we're going to do now is get the next line, and we'll just start running it all the way up to the house. So we start at the top of the cabin. We need to unravel this long well pipe. Just keep right on this path right here. I love it. Let's connect it. I want to get Let's it going. Let's connect it. That's what I'm talking about. That should be good. All right. I really hope it comes out. No, me too. Should be any second. Can you feel it? <gasps> oh. There it goes. We got water. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> Wow. We got water, Eustace! Now more water! Yeah! I'm so thankful that this actually worked. I'm super grateful for Eustace and all of his help, and it, it'll definitely change, change everything for us out here. Keep it running. It'll freeze up. I mean, in 20 minutes, this cold, it, maybe even in 10 minutes. If you keep it running, it won't freeze. You don't have to know how to do it. You just have to be willing. And these guys are willing, and that makes all the difference in the world. I love it. Water to spare. <laughs>
and a lot of help getting a handle on the essentials. Heat, shelter, food, and water. The water's been a huge help. We're not having to hike down. It's not taking half our day. I mean, we've, we've been able to do so much more lately. Winter has been extremely hard. We wouldn't have made it without Eustace. Eustace has taught us a very unique thing, which is how to provide that for ourselves, these very essential things to our life. But now that spring has arrived, it's time to graduate from basic survival to sustainability. Ashley and I, we have expenses building up. Eustace is gonna help us use our land to provide a source of income. Eustace is an expert at turning a raw mountain wilderness into a home. He's been living here on his own terms for the better part of three decades. And the secret to his success is knowing how to read the forest. This looks like a good spot. I see a bunch of downed trees right there. Last night, a giant windstorm blew through the area, leaving behind a giant opportunity to clean up. And how was it for you guys in that big storm? It was windy. But our cabin stayed all good. Yeah. good. Let me just show you what I'm seeing right here. Yeah, some of this stuff, it, see how that's solid? It's, it's a little bit rotten on the outside, but it's solid inside? Yeah. But basically, this is money laying on the ground going away fast, like, because it rots fast. Right. So if you can identify ones that are still good enough, then you can saw this up and sell it. You see these gorgeous pines you got here? Yeah. I mean, that's a valuable tree. That's worth several hundred dollars. Gotcha. If you learn how to extract what you need to pay your taxes and pay your bills from your land and you can sustain it and keep it going forever, you'll always have resources coming in. Well, we like the idea of being able to sustain ourselves. So. It's so important. That's what I want to help you with so that you can keep this land forever, you know? Let's see if we can start sawing some of this up. Yeah, Alrighty. let's do it. Have you failed trees much before? No, not much. Well, let me teach you how. That's one of the lessons you got to learn. That what you don't cut on the tree is what controls how it falls. And so I would cut a, what I call the face cut. It's the part in the direction you want it to fall. Your second cut intersect it so you can take out a slice. It looks like a piece of watermelon. I'm just gonna stand here and be ready to, to help you, okay? So. Okay. Harrison's a little bit afraid of that noisy thing, but I'm gonna teach him how to do it and how to do it right. Drop your motor even more. There you go, now you're talking. Woo. That's good, now back out of the way. Good job. Thanks. Let's work this one up, and then we'll get you to get a bigger one. Harrison is on a roll, harvesting his own green gold. Which way do you think it's going to fall? Looks like it might fall in line with that sycamore tree. Sounds good. I bet you can do it. Thank you. Just this morning, he and Ashley have harvested nearly half a dozen trees from their land, which can bring in $400 a cord for firewood. We got that loaded down. <laughs> Look what we've done over here. Let's check that out. By clearing this out and, and taking the cold trees out, they'll grow at least 20% faster. Wow. Well, I'm glad we're learning this. Yeah, wow. glad to teach it. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff to yeah. know. We should get, get chopping so we can sell some of this. Crack the whip. Pay yeah. some bills. Let's... The team heads back to the sawmill to finish the job using Eustace's gas-powered log splitter. Wait a minute. Hey, hey, stop. 
But when they arrive, they discover that last night's windstorm left even more damage in its wake. Oh, no. That storm just tore the roof up. There it go. Yeah, th that does not look good. Wow. Branches right through the roof. Oh, man. We're going to have water pouring through that roof. Oh, that's a big old hole. It's already gotten this bell soaked. This hay is what the horses depend on. The crop is supposed to last the horses another five months. Looks like one over here, too. And another one. It's wet right here, too. It's going to ruin all this hay. And while the hay can withstand a little moisture, it won't survive another rainstorm. So Eustace can't wait to make the repairs. Try to walk right on top of the nailers. And luckily, he has a good crew standing by. Tent is slick. Be careful. What do you see up there? This looks real bad, Eustace. Oh, no. What's the damage look like on the other side there? Uh, I see at least a few holes. While tin roofs are more durable than most, they're difficult to patch. The best fix is to add a new underlayer of corrugated metal. See, basically, we need to pry up these two nails to get this piece up underneath. You always have to shingle it over so that the water just keeps going down. And so we'll try pulling this out. Now, this should go up underneath there. We have to get it up to where it sits on top of the, the other nailer. See, now it doesn't matter if yeah. it leaks, because it'll leak onto this piece of metal, and then it'll just keep on going down. Perfect. All nail holes have to be caulked to make the gaps watertight. Yeah, just get them good. Really push it down in there, push it down in the hole. You want that water just to shed off of it. We've got to get up there and get that biggest one. That rain could be coming in any time, and I don't want that hay to get wet. That's yeah, right over sure. that big bale of hay. We're going to have to rope you up on that other side. You see how steep it is? The hardest job is still ahead, to fix the steepest side of the roof. I've got a lot of experience uh, roping up and being up in trees and on buildings, and there's nothing that you can allow to distract you. You sure you got me? Oh, yeah, I got you. All right. You doing all right over there, Harrison? Yeah. With the roof repair complete. Woo! Ready to come up! They've avoided the double blow. Come on up! Of another mountain storm. All right. All right. Do we get it? I think it's looking pretty good. Hopefully that water will stay off that hay now. I bet you got them. And I got all the holes on, on this side, so. Yeah! Hopefully it'll be good. Woo! <laughs> good job, team. Thank you. Really nice to have y'all's help. Y'all have done an excellent job, not just on this roof, but everything we've worked on. Well, you've helped so much with us, so we're, we're glad to help you. It's nice to be able to take what I've spent my whole life learning and give them a foundation for it. Very good. Y'all have a good night. Bye. Be safe. It's just a really cool trade because they want to learn the old mountain man ways, and I enjoy teaching them. After seeing the grit they showed, I can see them helping me into my older age, so I would really like it if they decide to stay with me.